The Dice Tower, episode 648. Woo! Joyously annoyed at Dice Tower West. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, but especially all these people who play them. On today's show, we're in Vegas for Dice Tower West, and the crew has assembled to share our little joys and small annoyances in the world of board gaming. I'm Eric Summer, and here's your host, the Barry Manilow of board gaming, <laughs> Tom Dice. Okay, I like that. I like that. All right, folks. Well, welcome here to the show. I'm Tom Basil. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. I'm Eric Summer. I'm Crystal Pisano. And I'm Z Garcia. Hi. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to just jump right into this soon. We're here at Dice Tower West um, 2020, and we're talking about small annoyances and joys. Not things that I think get us that angry. Small annoyances. Oh. Huh? Small annoyances. Small joys. I'm thinking of one now. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what that could be. <laughs> See, we got a crossover? Uh-huh. We're about to wear it. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're like putting things in pairs together. Now, mine are, I think, all mine are very specifically... What are you looking not, not at? Nothing. What for? Um, all mine are about... Board games themselves as a physical product. I have some stuff to talk about there. What did you guys do? I didn't really give a lot. Mine are more experiential related to board games. I was all over the place. <laughs> am. I, I am, am all over the yes, place. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. Got to keep you on your toes. Yeah, mine are mostly about board game inclusions or exclusions. I'm a Z. Okay. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're, gonna, we're doing these like in groups of five here. So we'll do... A, a good thing and a bad thing together. And there we go. Eric, you're going to have to number us here. Number five. <laughs> okay, so something I like in games is I like the idea of a shared universe. So think Ryan Lockett. All his games are kind of in the same universe. I like the idea that a character from one game might show up in another. Now, this doesn't actually happen a lot. I mean, sometimes it's on the nose, like the Arkham Horror stuff that Fantasy Flight does. They just, I mean, it saves them money with art. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, but the Ryan Lockett thing I like a little bit better. He even has it so that basically the Empires of the Void, which is a space game, even that somehow is in the same universe. I think that's cool. On the flip side, a confusing shared universe I dislike. And by this I mean, when you name all your games the same... So that I don't know what each one is, that mm-hmm. bothers me. So someone was just yesterday saying, do you like Valeria? Yep. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> one of them. You mean, which Valeria do you mean? They're very different games, but they all have Valeria in the title. Or a game that has the same title and at the bottom, it's, you know, like a subset of that game. Something that's different. That drives me nuts. It's no good to me as a consumer, because I think I'm getting the other game and I'm not. Or you don't know what's an expansion and what isn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it, it, I'm, I, had, I had one in mind. I keep thinking of Valeria. That's yeah. of my mind. Yeah. And again, I like the Valeria games. This isn't necessarily a knock against the games. It's just that Kingdoms of Valeria and Who Cares of Valeria. <laughs> it doesn't uh, sound like a knock against the games at all. Really. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I, it, I don't know. I don't even remember which one does which. Sounds like you love them. <laughs> is what I'm saying. That is what my thing is, number five. What about you, Suzanne? All right. My number five category is people. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Joy wrote one. <laughs> Annoyance wrote two. So a uh, small joy that I have are players that help set up and break down your game with you when they play. <laughs> It's a, it, it can be a small thing or a big thing, depending on the size of the game, and it takes a lot of work. Everything goes faster, and the more people that help, the sooner we can play another game. Now, a I small... I this is going. <laughs> no, no. A small annoyance, maybe a big annoyance for me, is uh, are, um, people who tap 
or rub or scrape their cards on the table while they're playing and bend my cards and they tap, 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 or they rub them on, like, I, like, they, like, scrape, like, they're trying to, like, pick a paint, like, scrape the paint off the table with a card. Like, like, fiddlers, card fiddlers are small. Maybe, maybe slightly moderate annoyances to me. <laughs> like, like the fancy restaurant where they got the crummer? Yes, mm-hmm. like, but, but my cards are not crumb removers. Or they're not supposed to. Who does this? Uh, I know a lot. Well, you've never played Look, there were people agreeing. They oh, know. You the, know people that fiddle with your cards. Okay. And it, no. I'm just talking about removing crumbs with the cards. Oh, well. No one does that. I mean, pies leaves a lot of crumbs okay. on the table, so something's good. <laughs> Eric? So, uh, my number five, I named as everything in its place. I love it when a game board has little corrals for all of the things. You, you open up the game, and these teardrop-shaped things go in the teardrop-shaped corral there, and these gem-shaped things go there, and then it's, it's so simple. You don't even, you barely need instructions to set up the, the, the stuff. I love it. It just, I'm one of those, you know, you don't want your food to touch sort of people. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, when I'm setting up a game, it drives me bananas when setup instructions are on page 14. <laughs> but first, I have to get through the lore of the universe. Oh, I have so to get sorry. through the three or four major concepts that you should understand before you even set up the game, or before you even know what the object of the game is, or even what kind of game you're playing. But first, you get the illustrations of all the eight character factions in the game. <laughs> set up on page 14 is just a small annoyance. That's my number five. This sounds very specific. No, no, just a general thing. <laughs> Lies! Lies! <laughs> All right, for my number five, I'm going to start with the annoyance and then move to the joyful thing. So the annoyance for me is when you are playing a game where you need to keep some information hidden. It could be a social deduction game. It could be another game where there is some kind of hidden information. And one of your friends or your spouse or just someone you're playing with, maybe you just met them, reads you like a book like you think you know exactly what you're doing and they're like okay so I I know she thinks we think she's gonna do that so she clearly went over there and they nail you every time I I have a buddy who does this to me in games frequently and I love him but it's annoying Um, but on the flip side of that isn't it so delightful when you can pull one over on the whole table? <laughs> Literally just, you, they, no one has a clue that you're the bad guy. No one has any idea that you've been screwing them over the whole game. <laughs> that is just one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is my number five. You terrify me. <laughs> she seems so friendly. Oh, I'm rooming with her too. <laughs> Hilarious. The whole time. All right. My number five is quite simple. Uh, my little annoyance is something I just experienced a little moment ago. With no right there. That is no tie-breaking rule. Thank it's, you. Uh, yeah. It's a very simple thing to put in most games. In fact, you would notice in most of the games you play, if you hit a tie... There's at least two people at the table who love to guess at what the tiebreaker is before you can look it up, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, most resources left, for sure. <laughs> most, most money. And then you get to the end of the rule book. Players share the victory. Yeah. It's, always, it's always rejoice in your shared victory. Yeah, you're, you're supposed to be happy about it. I do not rejoice. <laughs> for you, it should say, players put up with the fact we didn't come up with a tiebreaker rule <laughs> and share the victory. And it's never even like a hard thing to do. No. That's what I'm saying. It seems like an obvious thing. Anyway, so that's the one. And then on the flip side of that, I love games that have both open and hidden scoring yeah. in the same yeah. game. I love it. One of my little issues I had with uh, Kingsburg when it first came out before the expansion was all the scoring is open. All of it. There's nothing you don't see on the track. And so you can kind of see it coming. And it leads to a sort of deflated feeling at the end of the game. And then completely hidden scoring, I just have no idea who's doing well, who's not. I don't like that either. So a little bit of both is my sweet spot for games. I want to see some progress, and I want to play something close to the chest, you know. So that's my number five. Take it to Ryan. Sure, yeah, take it to Ryan. 
Number four. That's somehow even better than last time. <laughs> All right, my uh, joy here is I really like, and this is especially the case here with game trays, uh, inserts. I, now, you'll notice if you've been looking at the library, how many of the inserts have been thrown away? <laughs> A good chunk of them have been. <laughs> now, look, I, I, I love inserts. I think they're really great and cool inserts, but the fact is most inserts don't work well when the game is turned vertically, and so... What my small joy is, is the inserts with the snap-on lids. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I really like that. I mean, I know it's a little bit more money, there's a little bit more plastic that goes in, but it just, it makes me feel good. Now, not that it snaps on so tightly that when you pull it off, everything, everything goes slides out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I've definitely done that. Yeah. But those snap-on lids, or even if it's just one snap-on thing at the very end, you put everything in, and then you snap it in the box, and then it's just very satisfying. On the other hand, I love inserts a lot of times, and I think it's really cool when the cards go in the insert and you pull out the cards. And sometimes these inserts have a little finger thing that you can stick in to pull it out. But some moron from hell <laughs> has decided that for some reason it only needs to go halfway down. <laughs> And this I have is not no idea. Yeah. And this is not just like what game this has happened to me. Sometimes it goes almost all the way down. Yeah. And like the only way cards. to get the cards out is to like put your arm on part of the stuff, flip the box over, and then dump the cards out, in which case they don't come out. You gotta tap the bottom of the box. And when you do, your arm moves and all the rest of the pieces fall over to place. <laughs> so maybe I might have sounded harsh against the person who designed that earlier. So let me retract it and say they're just. Uh, no, I was right. <laughs> Can you guys give me any good reason why that happens? Like why the, the finger thing doesn't go all the way down? No, there is no good reason. It saves plastic? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's oh, the opposite, isn't it? Um, no, 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 they the cut out the plastic. No. <laughs> And they're passing the savings on to you. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you were going to be mad when the finger hole was too small. Well, there's that. Or sometimes they don't have a finger hole at all. That's true, too. And I, I don't care about... I don't like that, but the finger gives you that hope. You're like, oh. <laughs> no, That's why it's worse. That's why it's worse. Because you start to be like, ooh, look at that. And, and you're stuck halfway down. And then uh, what I end up doing is remove half that deck that you can and then take a card and start trying to fish the yeah, other yeah, ones yeah. out. Yeah, but, but then, then that annoys you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't do it with my own games. <laughs> I, this has happened a lot recently and I really hate it. So, sorry. That was number four. <laughs> my number four category is storage, so along your lines. My small joy, we all love a good insert. We've, we've covered that on but the, the extra, right? We all can talk about sleeves or no sleeves, all that. The extra on a good insert is when the wells are mold labeled. Like when the label for what goes into a spot is molded into the spot. Amen. Amazing. Name, right? Oh, it's such a little detail and it makes such a world of difference. And similar to your finger hole. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we are recording. Uh, it's it's not hard to do. If you plan ahead, it's not hard to do in an insert. I know a little bit about this, though. So. Uh, anyway, uh, on the other hand, no storage solution in the box is a small annoyance. I like not even a baggie, not a single, yeah. not a single thin side, hard to open baggie, not even that. And it's such a pain in the neck. And I mean, we all have tons of bags and whatever, but no storage solution in a box, I think, is a little chintzy and it drives me bonkers. And then I have to go find one of the packets of bags that were left over from another game that actually thought about it, but they're spread all over my house. And then you find one that's too big or one's too small. Yeah, yeah. it's just a little annoying. My number four. My number four is I love it when there are references, little Easter eggs, hidden in the art in a game. For example, if you look at Agricola, 
and you look at some of those room tiles very closely, you might find out that those little farmers are playing Bonanza. Or even a copy of Agricola in this weird Inception sort of art. I love it when, and especially when it's one that you didn't notice right away. You know, it's a game you've played several times, and suddenly you're sort of staring at your player board and going, oh my goodness, that, there's like, you know, they're playing another game there, or this is a, a sci-fi reference I didn't recognize before. I love that sort of thing, and it's a small little joy that, that just sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot inside. So I have like Santa Claus, Thor. Yeah. Thor's in there? Yeah. See, I haven't seen that, and I love that. Yeah. I'm, now I'm gonna watch. Waiting right? for you. Really? I <laughs> not, not like Marvel comic Thor. There's like, I don't know. The it real not it, It's just a guy with a hammer. <laughs> it's a dude with a hammer. <laughs> He's wearing a jacket and he's carrying a hat. Yeah. Santa Claus, look for him. All right. Okay. I love those references. However, when illustrators get a little too excited, they can sometimes make it more difficult to actually play the darn game. If the illustrations are too flowery and start to go over the boundaries of spaces you're supposed to go, suddenly you don't know where you're supposed to go anymore. The rule book says if you go on a forest space, you get all these resources. There's trees all over the board! I don't know what a forest space is anymore because the artist loved the trees too much. So when the art gets in the way of actually playing the game, it's a small annoyance. So you literally can't see the forest for the trees. Uh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alright, my number four. So, uh, when we did the round, <laughs> did you expect anything less? There's a reason I like now. <laughs> so, during the raffle earlier, we had people in the game room raise their hands, and I'm going to do it one more time. How many of you have taught somebody a game this week during the con? For the audio show, <laughs> that's approximately half the room. It, yeah, easily half the room. So, my small joy is when I am teaching a game to someone that they didn't necessarily have any familiarity with before and I can see them falling in love with it as we're playing. Oh, cool. yeah. That just look on their face that you can tell that they are just digging it so hard. They're going to buy that game as soon as they can. It's maybe going to become one of their all-time favorites. That moment that I got to introduce to them is one of my favorite moments in gaming. Um, but on the flip side, when you're teaching someone a game and halfway through you can tell they're not digging it at all. <laughs> they are just having a heck of a time, and they're like, oh, and they're being polite, they're still playing, they're not necessarily running away from the table, but you just, you're already feeling guilty about it, you can tell it's not for them, and it really bums me out every single time that happens, so. It's worse than the glazed over look, it's like, yeah, they understand everything you're saying, oh, yeah. they just know they're not going to like it. This is just not for them. There's this, so, you, so this is a pick up and deliver game in space, they go, oh. <laughs> Would you rather than be passive aggressive about it like that, or like I'm just not my game group per se, but let's some random group just tells you how awful the game is two minutes in, and then continually mentions it throughout the rest of the game. I mean that's the worst. Like either at that point, if you're having that bad of a time and you're not that far invested, maybe say something. Yeah. Be polite about it, but just say you know what I I don't want to bring down the tone of this room or this game or this con, and so I'm just gonna politely step away if that's okay with you. I think that that is okay to do. Or, I've never heard it said in such a manner. Or just say, this is straight garbage. <laughs> I'm out. I'm gonna go get a turkey sandwich. This game is bad and you should feel bad. I mean, you should hate yourself for teaching this to people. How dare you? Dang, that's like... <laughs> is it me? <laughs> No, I'm thinking about a turkey sandwich. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> excuse me. My number four is, I'm gonna start with the, 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 the little joy here. It's not, it's not much of one, the other one's better. Uh, and that is when a game is largely an abstract game or a Euro game, but they take the time to give you that opening paragraph, the setting. Much like you were saying, some games overdo it and just don't get to set up till you know, whatever page. I like it when, when the game takes the trouble to at least give you not just the cover of the game and the back of the box to you know put, put you there, but they give you a little paragraph, a little something, even if it's a stretch. 
Now, some games that are, are quite the stretch, and those I actually think, why'd you even bother? You know, you like you're all, you know, I don't know, like Maybe you're an problem. acorn, and you're rolling along the ground, and suddenly you discover a book, and you're like, okay, whatever, man. It's an abstract. What game is this? I would like to play it. Please. But when they try a little bit. I appreciate it. It helps with the teach, especially for me, because I, I can kind of mention that a little bit at first, and then hopefully weave it in a bit. Try to help. And then the thing that I really dislike is when games overdo that, and it spills from the rule book and the you know the sort of general concepts in the game to start renaming things we all have basic <laughs> words for in the game. Of course, I'm thinking here of uh, Android Netrunner, okay? The deck of cards that you shuffle and you put in front of you, it's called the deck. The deck of cards. But they have a word for that. In fact, they have two words for that. Because the two sides are different. So mine is like my R&D department, and yours is like your heap or whatever, your grip. And so your grip is like your hand on one side. That's your hand of cards, grip. And then the other side is called your, I don't know. And then the discard has a name. And then the, everything has a word. And so I have to not just teach you this game, but teach you basic concepts of gaming. Like the cards you're holding in your hand. That's a different word than you expect it to be. It's like learning a new language. Yeah, it's like, yeah. come on, you don't have to be that thematic. You have to learn Esperanto in order to play the yeah. game. So that's a little much, that bothers me when they overdo it like that. That's my number four. Number three! Um, okay, so I really like, there's a lot of play raids and things with games, so both might have to do with that. The, the positive thing is I like when information is on the board, right? Yeah. The, nowadays, you know, companies, they get it's handy to put the information on the back of the rules booklet, despite the fact that I'm going to be flipping through that rules booklet throughout the game. Or they'll put it somewhere else, but on the board... You know, when there's little symbols and things on the board, or a little spot on the board that shows you this is what happens at the end of a round. Here's actually the rounds written on the board. That's really handy. It really makes it easier to teach people. I'll say, by the way, this costs three. How do I know that? It's written right there. I love that sort of thing, and I'm starting to notice that, I think, in more games. I think it's a cool idea, and I hope to see more of that. Uh, what I dislike when it comes to player aids is when the, they make a pretty decent player aid, and they'll put one in the box for you, for a five-player game. <laughs> and then I have to pass it around. I, I almost, this doubles with, I also am not a big fan of games. I understand we want to be language independent, but there comes a point where you just need to stop. Yeah. If I have to consistently, every time, what does this card do? Well, just show me the card. I can't show you the card, because if I show you the card, then you know what the card does. <laughs> well, here's the book. I can't find the card in the book. All right, give me the book back, and tell me what the card looks like a little bit, and I'll guess it. <laughs> eventually, they tell you what the card is, and you're like, okay, this is... A so this card cancels the card when someone else plays it. I won't use that information against you. <laughs> this seems really specific. <laughs> no, it's not. That's the no, thing. No, I know what you mean. That's happened a lot to me. I, I just... Give each player their own player aid. Put it on the board. And don't put it on the back of the player board. <laughs> oh, you mean something you're going to put put objects on? Yes, and then you're going to flip it. Here's where you store your resources. Also, the instructions are on the other side. <laughs> yeah, I just, it's, it's, yeah, there's just, I could talk about player aids for a really long time. <laughs> All you have to do is play on a glass table and then just crawl <laughs> underneath and read it from there. <laughs> No, no, no. I like to thank all the people who go on the board game geek and make really cool yeah. custom yeah. player aids. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I've, I've been printing them out, putting them in the games here and stuff. It just makes life a lot easier. You can print out as many as you want. Well, until we run out of cutlery. Yes. <laughs> I'm done. Alright, my number three category is rule books. Yes. So my little joy in rule books are when rule books clearly show what the components are with yes. a visual. Yes. And when it's cards, yes. they show you the front and yes. the back yes. of the card. 
I, I hate like, okay, so your supply deck goes over here and your engine deck goes over here and then you've got cards and you're looking at them and the fronts look the same and the backs, one's purple and one's blue, but they look identical otherwise <laughs> and you don't know which ones. And it's like, well, this 16 card deck and this 14 card deck and I'm like, so then you're sitting there counting out, okay, which one is it? And then you have ones that have promos and then you are like, well, now it's 16, 16, which one is it? And things like that. So well done component layouts and rulebooks are a small joy. A small annoyance for rulebooks are square shaped, 12 inch square fold out rulebooks where yeah. it's a triple fold and you've got like a rulebook wall that like you can surround yourself with and you want to look up one darn thing in the middle of the game and you got to open it up while you realize it's not on the setup page and it's somewhere on the second page but then you're like you're looking at the end game oh game end final score and you're like no I just want to know what this icon means and then you have to fold it out over again and then you're spread out on the table and you're searching through it they're terrible for reference they're terrible for holding they're really hard to lay out graphics design-wise, they're not good for anything. They're not even good for teaching the whole game. And I hate them. I mean, okay, maybe that's a large noise. <laughs> Was there like a law passed that they required rule books to be the same size as the box? It's okay I it's hate small, right? Books. They don't shift around that way. They sit flat. They act as a cover. No, come on, your insert's not a thing. Nobody's worried about that. Wait, which, who are you talking to? Eric or me? It's an Eric. Oh, okay. Eric, come on. The, the, the ridiculous claim that they don't shift around. Who cares? If I they mean, do. I love my square books that I buy. <laughs> go to the bookstore, where's the square book Pop -up. section? Pop-up books. All the best picture books are square. <laughs> well, and then there are some things that are like the square. Yeah, they're terrible. That, it just, I don't know, that just really bugs me too. I'm, I'm with you on this. That was my number three. My number three is similar to yours, uh, Suze, uh, your insert comment, where uh, you have specific wells uh, that, that tell you where you're supposed to put all this stuff to put it away. Uh, I didn't quite go that far, because, I mean, that's awesome. I like that better than my idea. I, I just want packing instructions. If you're going to give me the, you know, uh, 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 an insert or a well or whatever that has all these compartments, tell me what goes in them. If you're going to give me a bunch of tuck boxes, if you're going to give me a bunch of Whatever you're doing, tell me how it all fits back in the box the way it's supposed to go. Because sometimes it's not totally clear. Yeah. Uh, I love it when when a, a game offers that. And it just, I feel like I put it together the way I want it. It's a small joy that I know everything's where it's supposed to be. <laughs> what I don't like is when I get a random number of bags <laughs> in the box. I mean, it's, it's great that, that a company decides to put in bags. I, I'm happy for it. But if there's four different player colors, and they have a bunch of stuff, a bunch of components for each player, you'd think there'd be four bags in there. There are two. <laughs> or a company goes the other way, and there's four player colors, and then like some money and uh, a couple of other tokens. Six bags, right? Seventeen bags. <laughs> It's like, well, thank you. Why 17? Why 17? Why did they pick that number? I don't under... It's because they know they're covering for the game company, so giving you any bags. They, don't, they need a few extra. I guess. So it, it's, it's very... Um... At this point, I'm pretty sure we all have a very large collection of extra baggies yeah. at home. But, yeah. but they're not uniform, like Sue said. <laughs> you have this bag of bags, from all different sizes, from all the extras. Are you supposed to use the bag that the bags come in? I'm never sure on that. I don't know. Is that one of the bags? I don't know! <laughs> It's like, how many squares? The big one? That's also square! <laughs> you know what? I always miscount by one when I do those puzzles. Yeah, but it's not as good problem as the bags that are inside. It's right, like it's, it's like a like thin that's... bag that holds the good bags, but then you still need to use the thin bag. And then there's the, the uh, wooden components that all come in little bags. Oh, yeah, like yeah. every color was sorted differently at the factories. Yeah. You get little tiny oh, bags. Oh, I almost put that on my list. Those little bags are oh. the devil. <laughs> Throw those away immediately. I mean, I to, to open them, I just start ripping. Yeah. Oh, you. Oh, yeah. No, I should do that. Oh, yeah. It's so much easier. Yeah. Did you know that the little packs in there aren't gum? The little white packets oh, no. that come in all those little white packs. Silica gel packets. Go way off topic here. What? What about them? They're not gum. They look like chewing gum. No, they're they not gum. Like gum. Mouth and it, like it says it right on there. Oh, dude. No. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta be God. They say jelly. Oh. <laughs> ah, so my number three. Where were we? Random number of bags. Do you know bag? No. 
know, back in the day, I don't remember the name of the game, it's slipping my mind. Z-Man made a game from Christopher Bollinger, a space game about zombies in the future. Anyway, it's, it was, but it came with the, all these components for the box, and they, we didn't know how to put them in, you know, it didn't tell you, and then the rules was kind of like, that's the first game to put everything back in the box. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, maybe people will figure it out and post it online. <laughs> and they did, and I, I, at the time I thought, okay, ha, 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 ha. Now people are doing it all the time. I'll get it, and there's an awesome insert, and I can't figure out how anything goes in there. Really? See, I, I was being a little facetious, but I thought that was that was probably the first not great pick so far in this whole list. The whole like, tell me where the thing goes. Who cares? Like, just put it somewhere it fits. No. Unless it's for a really specific game with minis, and like the mini goes in exactly its vacuum formed spot. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a whole. Really I have picked things. a bag. They, they go in the hole with the back finger hole. Fill <laughs> the finger hole with round okay. bits. No. <laughs> I put that Suburbia Deluxe Edition thing in where it gave you like a shot from 200 miles away of how it was. I counted the tiles out. There was two extra tiles and it didn't show you anywhere they went in the thing. And I went and talked to Bezier Gates and he was like, well, you know, you just figure out where to put them. <laughs> Speaking of pieces fitting into place, uh, my number three is when you are playing a game, and it could be an engine building game or something similar, and everything you've built up just works perfectly. This cascades into that, cascades into this, and all of the things you've set up just go off without a hitch. Everything works smoothly, you don't even have to think about it, it's just really, really seamless. I love, love, love games where the design makes it easy for you to help yourself yes. on your turn. Yes. Conversely, I hate it when you are playing a game and you cannot get any momentum going whatsoever. Like everybody else is like, oh yeah, I'm doing uh, eight things on this turn. And this person's like, oh, I'm doing nine things this turn. And you're looking at your stuff and you're like, I, I can't afford that. And I, I don't have enough of the resources for that. And, and you're just, they're like, yeah, we're doing all these things. And you're like, I can't do anything. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And you're just like, wow, I'm bad at games now. That's not, not one of the, my best moments, and that is one of my little annoyances, is games that make it hard to get engines going. Yes. That feels fresh. Like, that feels like a little wrong. You know, yeah. a little bit. Okay. <laughs> it happens to you all the time, you get used to it. <laughs> well, maybe I'm just better at games than you. Oh. Oh, 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 I'm better at games, I don't care. <laughs> One of my little annoyances is fake bragging. <laughs> brag, brag for real. Now my uh, number three here, my little annoyance is something that Tom loves to make fun of me for, and that is that I, I'm not, I don't hate, but I generally dislike stupid star player rules. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. That say like, the, you know, the person who most recently ate a banana is a star player because the game has monkeys in it or something. It's like, oh, who cares, you know? Just pick, uh, either say, random play of starts or something that is kind of interesting to what the game has going on, not something that the players did, or just youngest or oldest or whatever, you know? Figure out if your game has a, you know, star player advantage, then it's the youngest player. I, I love starts. those rules. Huh? I love those rules. Yeah. <laughs> or if, you're, you know, if your game punishes the star player a little bit because the players can pick on them, then it's the oldest player who the star player is. That's the general idea. Easy but to say no. when you're younger. What's that? Easy to say when you're younger. Well, I'm saying it could be either way. You know, we have a first player advantage or disadvantage. But the whole goofy rule, if, if players are meant to actually follow them, slow down the going or the game going, lead to discussion that sometimes can be funny, but usually is just sort of cringe-worthy, and then you finally get going. So I don't like that too much. Um, the thing I do like, when you finally do get going, I love games that have an asymmetric setup, where I, have, I start with bits or, or something that nobody else has. So at the beginning I'll have 
you know, one wheat and uh, I get a card. And the second player gets two resources of their choice, but no cards. And maybe the next player then begins with five coins or two cards. I love those little things at the beginning. So that I feel like I'm already on a, at a different place in the game and we haven't even started yet. That makes me happy because that makes me feel like, okay, I'm on my own path. I'm doing my own thing already. And I just enjoy that. I love games that are asymmetric anyway. And if you start me off that way, then I can really, I feel like I'm really leaning into it already. And, you, and the game designer wants me to. So I enjoy that a lot. Asymmetric opening position or bits or cards or whatever. And that's my number three. Number two. I'll do the annoyance first here. That is, I'm getting really tired of generic art and very specifically fantasy generic art. You know, uh, just genericness in fantasy games in general. I think fantasy can be a very wide open field. There's a lot of cool things, and we can see that Blue Maven took fantasy and did something different with it, and other games have done things different with it. I get that D&D is an inspiration, and thank you, D&D, but not every barbarian wears furs. You know, and that every monk decides they're not going to use weapons and stand around and shave their heads bald. And not every paladin looks the same and orcs. And specifically, I think dragons are cool, but they all look the same. After a while, I'm, just, I'm, I'm dragon blind. You know, <laughs> I look at them all and they just look the same. And this, I don't know, this is just bugging me more and more. And it feels like they don't put a lot of effort into it, especially naming it. I played a fantasy game recently where you got a sword and... You know, then better sword and things like that. <laughs> better sword? That's hilarious. If you actually have a game that said better sword, <laughs> you need to show me this. I, want to see this. I would play that one. I'm going to play the slightly better sword. <laughs> Bigger hammer. <laughs> so, eh, it's a small noise, but I just, I just find it to be, it's kind of lazy. Like, even zombies, they all look, there's, it just seems like a lot of that is the same stuff. I mean, I used to, I'm ragging on this stuff now. I used to rag on the uh, middle, uh, the Middle Ages artwork because a lot of that looks the same. You know, no one can smile there because it takes too long to draw them. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and that and that might be true, but I think it's definitely moved in the fantasy realm, especially each Kickstarter. We're consistently like, oh, look, it's a new Kickstarter about fantasy stuff. Well, what's different about it? Well, they, it could all be in the same universe. All right. Well, here's what I like though. I like characters in games where you can flip the board and it's the same character but different art. Usually, specifically flipping genders. I like that a lot. I'm like, oh, I want to play this character. I want to play the other character. You know, uh, this is something that's you know, my kids. I tend to have mostly girls in my house, um, and we we bought and buy games, and there's usually three boys and one girl character in the game. My kids complain about that. I get it, but. It just seems like, I know it's a little bit more work to pay the artist, but Atlantis Rising did a really yeah. good job at it. Yes. The art there is yes. fantastic. And it's, I just don't feel like it's that difficult to do. Just flip the character and draw it differently. It doesn't have to be male, female. It could be a tall guy and a short guy, you know, or whatever, you know. I, I just like that aspect a lot. So, that's my small joy. I like it. Before I talk about my, I, I'd like to know, you keep on flipping this this clipboard over, like you're hiding, the only person that can potentially see it is me. So what are you trying to hide from me? <laughs> try and look like, at what it. do you think I'm going to do also, your list? It also lists my top ten important games of the decade, and maybe you haven't watched that video yet. I haven't. That's fair. <laughs> All right. Well, so you're protecting me. It's to protect me. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. All right. So small noise. Spoiler the guy right. who flips clipboard. Like <laughs> <that>. <laughs> okay. My number two category, expansions. And I think we can all have a lot of small and large annoyances out of expansions. Um, I will say my small joy, or maybe big joy, out of expansions is when expansions have a very clear mark that identifies a card as part of an expansion. And I'm not talking about like, like a two-point font 
letter at the bottom of the corner that blends in with like the serial number of the car that you have to get your monocle out to try to inspect. Okay, is that an R or is that a B? Well, Race for the Galaxy did the little, the little notches. notches went up. Yeah, the notches. <laughs> that's, a three notches means it's from the third. Which one's the third expansion? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's. I want a clear. Like, it, 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 look at Magic the Other. I mean, for all of its its ridiculousness, it, it's, you can look, you can shuffle through and at least identify the, the icon fairly easily. Yes. So that's a, a good thing for sorting out expansions. My small annoyance, now, you could say different colored backs is an annoyance, but now that I better understand the production process of cards, I kind of give more publishers a pass because color matching between print runs is so impossible. But miss cut cards draw and i recently played a game and with it not even within the expansion but like in the different decks there was a quarter of a millimeter difference in the height of the cards wait the height yeah the height of the cards so when you try to sh- I, I riffle shuffle when you try to riffle shuffle it's the way to shuffle it, it, you can't do it because you just hit that minute minuscule miscut or change in the cut size and it, it won't shuffle cleanly. And it, that really is annoying when you see that a lot with expansions are miscut or different size cut cards in expansions. Are the Dominion expansions still not matching the original cards? I know that yeah, was an issue with one of them. Yeah, I think it's slightly off on some of them. I don't... Right. And it's annoying, right? Yeah. It, well, yeah, it depends. Sometimes it's so small I barely notice. It's when it's bigger. Do you riffle shuffle? I do. Okay. All right. I just shuffle. I do 52 card pickup. <laughs> <laughs> That's my number two. My number two is a category that involves my kids. Uh, oh. It's similar uh, to what Crystal talked about in teaching games here at the convention, but when I uh, teach a game to my kids, I'm trying to you know, spread the joy of gaming and, and maybe uh, <laughs> inspire them to, to enjoy this. You know, This is something they haven't seen before. Uh, and it, it's really cool when then I take them to a convention and I see them teaching that game that I taught them, you know, and, and that is really cool because it all sorts of uh, maturity level in, in uh, you know, gauging their audience and sharing and, and getting the feedback from their players as they learn a game from them. It's really cool and it, it makes me really happy and proud as a dad. And then your little annoyance is when you realize that game is missing from your collection. <laughs> Hold on, that was my copy you bought? <laughs> or, or is half the pieces are gone? Yeah. Or they, they take it to school and some other kid sits on it? Yeah. Ah. That, that isn't what I was thinking of. <laughs> we'll call that 2A. All right, buddy. You, got it. you can have that one. Because now my head is hot thinking about it. <laughs> okay. It's not the bunny hat. Don't worry. It's not. <laughs> Uh, the the annoyance, however, is is when I, I am going to present a game. I'm really excited to bring this out for the kids, and I set it all up. All right, it's family game night. It's dad's pick. I get to decide what we're going to play. Usually, they get to pick stuff, and the eight year old wants to make up a game. And well, fun, yes, but no, I get to pick the game. So we I set up the game, and we're going to you know. All right, kids, I get it. It takes you know ten fifteen minutes to get it all in 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 uh, position, and I'm reading the rule book, and okay. We're ready. Here's how you play this game. Dad, I'm not really feeling game tonight. Aww. I'm going to go read a book. Aww. Well, you know, the, the screens are off. Eric that's, is against reading. That's the rule. <laughs> and then the other one's like, nah, I don't want to play either. I'm going to go run around in a circle. <laughs> Eric is against exercise. <laughs> and I... This was my pick. Yeah. And I what kind of games are you teaching them? Man? Half your kids are reading. All right? <laughs> they read all the time. Great, then you're, you're doing wonderful. It's game night. <laughs> That's copyright. <laughs> yeah, baby, it took a moment. <laughs> it's a small annoyance. That's my number two. All right, for my number two, I have a deep love and appreciation for games that contain stories, whether that is a campaign game or just a regular game that contains story elements that you will go through as you are playing the game. And I absolutely love when the story within a game does something that surprises me. A lot of stories, especially those set in things like fantasy worlds or if it's a zombie thing, a lot of the moments in those games are somewhat predictable, if not 
just average. And when a game with a story throws out an element that really surprises you, that's what I love. Stuff like the crossroads cards in Dead of Winter, or some of the story points in a game like Legacy of Dragonhold. Those moments that you just really truly didn't see coming, but yet they feel so natural, and you're just shocked that you didn't see it coming. So those little surprises are what I really, really love. What I dislike is when a game sets up a world kind of like you all were talking about earlier, and they give you some lore and some backstory, and then the game has nothing to do with any of it. I'm looking at you, Dice Forge. I love Dice Forge. It's a wonderful game, and it's set in a really cool world. The game has nothing to do with that world. But the art's pretty. (laughs) And while I do love good art in a game, it's sometimes not enough. For the story. So that's my number two. Hmm. All right, my number two. My uh, little joy is player aid cards that have not just what you can do, but also somewhere on there on the other side that you won't look at uh, more than, you know, once or twice. Setup and end game scoring. Okay, on one side, I can use that side to set up. Figure out the scoring, and you know, just set it up, flip it to all the actions, turn breakdown, and at the end of the game, flip it back for scoring, where I can go back and forth if I want to remind myself, what am I doing? What am I collecting here? It's a, it's a such an obvious, simple thing to do, and I still see player eights that are single sided. Why? <laughs> Players will have some downtime. We can. It'll be one thing to look at at least. You know, give me a little more information here. But I don't have to go fishing for in the rule book. The flip side of that is. I see what he did there. When a. <laughs> was he? Yeah, that's all you, Suze. Um, uh, the back of a rule book being wasted. I really don't like that. I, I really dislike when I, I'm reading a rule book, I'm learning, and then I get to the back page, and it's. Blank, like just a continuation of the artwork from the front, Mm. or just like wood grain pattern. And I'm like, (laughs) the back of the rule book is like prime real estate for your game. There should be quick setup. There should be turn breakdown. There should be, uh, you know, easily forgotten rules. You know, I mean, anything. You're wasting the entire back of the rule book. Why? That drives me nuts, because you could just throw that rule book on the table with just the back facing up if it was useful, and it's, again, really handy. You can look over there and, okay, I got it. I remember what that is now, or I can, what's the next phase? There it is. And so that really, that kind of, it's an obvious miss is what really bothers me about it. Because it's like, you know, you could have used it. There was nothing preventing you from printing something on the back of the rule book and wasted it. So... That's my number two. That's where all the Kickstarter backer names go. <laughs> What's that? That's back where back. all the Kickstarter backer names go. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, oh, what a waste, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just stick with like the inside of the box, which is still it's ridiculous. You know, when you <laughs> take the, yeah. the lid off and on the side you just sort of see hieroglyphics. So you look close enough and you're like, oh, it's backers. <laughs> I still don't understand why they don't impose more rules on that. You know, if Jeremy Jordan and Bob Smith and Susan Sheridan want to back a game, but Uka Baba 4691, I don't want that on the side of my box. <laughs> Who is that guy anyway? Uka Bop Bop. You look at the side of some of these. It bothers me. Maybe they're of the box. That was my number six. Uka Bop Bops. No, no. I love that song. All right. Uka Bop Bop. And finally, number one. <laughs> In my lifetime, I punch out a lot of counters and things from games. So, so this is weird. This is how it was about to start rapping. <laughs> In my lifetime, I punch out a lot of counters and things from rule books. I'm punching hat. <laughs> you totally sound like you were about to just drop mad beats. <laughs> it's, a nice hour of hot musical. it's a very nice compliment. Thank you. But, <laughs> good. Oh. It was good. Uh, nowadays, I've delegated a lot of that to my um, interns. And... Um, <laughs> The problem is, is a few times now we 
have punched out canners and thrown them away, or, and you realize later you need them. So my small joy is I really like, and this has only been done a few times, but I love when it happens, they put a little garbage can or a little red X on the bits that are not needed. You can punch these out. I understand that counters have to have the same things on different sheets. You punch them out, you throw them away. That's fantastic. Let me know what I can throw away. And if you want me to keep the sheets in the box to put underneath the insert, to raise it up to the box level, whatever, putting that somewhere prominent where you don't read it in the back page of the rule book after you've thrown everything away <laughs> is also very nice. Small joy. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the thing I don't like is a bit of a crossover. Sue's already mentioned it, but I'm expanding on it because I hate this so much. I want to punch the box and the people who do this. What's in the game? I don't get it. And this is even doubly compounded with Kickstarter stuff where they decided to give me everything yeah. and the mother's uncle inside it too. And it's like, <laughs> you heard me. Um, no, but I, you just mentioned it. They, they list stuff, and especially when it's just in text. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Just in text. I, I can't look at text. The, the card's a picture. And then sometimes I count the cards and like you said, there's, it says, okay, there's, Put the, the oath cards over here. Okay, what are the oath cards? None of them have words on because who knows why. You know, and you find it and you're like, I think this is right, but it says 14 and there's 15 of this one and there's 18 of this one. There's no deck with 14 and then later on you are going through this other extra page and it says in this optional expansion there's an extra card that goes in the oath deck. Oh, so it's the 15 one. Great. Oh, wait, here's module two. There's two more cards that go in the oath deck. Oh, it's not the 15 one. It's, it's the, the 17 one. Right? Yeah. This is not a joke, right? <laughs> yeah. You're reliving real trauma. You might be laughing. That's great. And it's worse if your unpaid intern decides to punch everything out and throw it in the box together. Yep. And then you're like, oh, oh, there's a few modules and Kickstarter stretch goals, you know, the 200 that they include in here. Let's separate them back out because we don't want them in the base game. There's no way to know. It's almost like that unpaid intern has been trained that the entire box of components is going to be dumped, dumped out, out onto a table. Oh. 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 Okay, point. <laughs> boots and cats and boots and cats and boots. That's how you get that's, that's, that's how my children get <laughs> Yeah. All uh, right. Yes, I get that. Fuck. It just bugs me when there's all this stuff and I don't know how to sort it out. I just got a, a game clinic, which is a game. And in, <laughs> in clinic, there's all this extra stuff and it's in the back of the rule book. They list the components in the front but they list the extra stuff in the back. And then I'm like, well, what is this? Oh, these are zombies. Oh, I didn't know there were zombies in clinic. Oh, it's a little module. And just sorting that stuff out, it's very, very frustrating. I, I get it. Thanks. <laughs> yes, I brought it on myself. <laughs> All right, for my number one, let's have a discussion about protection, okay? <laughs> this is a serious topic. And it's one that I realized. Let's put it together. <laughs> it's one that I really realized I have very strong opinions and emotions about that I want to process here with you tonight. Okay? It's very important. It, Protection is absolutely important. And Some of us need unpaid interns. <laughs> Whatever do you mean? Oh, so let's talk about player shields. All right? Specifically player shields, which it turns out I care deeply about. So my little joy with player shields are when the publisher uses the back of the player shield to provide useful information. You are staring at the back of your player shield the entire game. If you do not turn that player shield into a useful player aid and reference guide that is useful for the whole game, I despise you. Okay? Good. 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 Good.
a game that I will not name because I'm not doing call out culture tonight. I'll do it. Right? But let's just say it's an auction game that has, say, four different types of auctions in it. But on the cards, to make them language independent, they just use an icon for which type of auction it's referencing. Game's not worth getting, don't worry about it. <laughs> hey, why don't you use this ginormous player shield and put icon equals this type of auction. Or you could do what you chose to do and give me a giant piece of cardboard that sits in front of me the whole game and I look at a blank white back. So just clarify, this is the joy? Oh yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> so I like it when I pull this just, don't do that. Got it. Sorry. As soon as I just played that game for the first time two weeks ago and the entire game, I was like, I'm so sorry. What does that one mean again? You know. The entire game. Okay. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's modern art. I think I have a version or I had a version of modern art that had that on the player aid. Well, there's like 18 versions yeah. of modern art. Yeah. I got the good one. Yeah. Yeah. Why the company's out of business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Snap. All right, but my little joy with player shields. No, actually, that was my little joy. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It's too annoying. The it's joy to it's a joy. No, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. When a good, that's, when a, that's when a shield. Cheap. I mean, I can say, like, conspiracy has, makes really good use of the player shield. And when you look at it, you got in my, my My little annoyance, because that wasn't it, are player shields that are too small. Yeah. Uh. Like, there are, there are multiple games I've had in my collection where they give you, like, it, it's like a Monty Python set. Like, would you like a wafer thing player shield that doesn't shield anything? Like, it doesn't hide anything. It barely stands up. It doesn't... You speak and it falls over. Yeah, you yeah. I, I, I that's agree that thing. it falls over. Yeah. Make sure, does no one test these, these player shields? Like a, a, a knockover test. Like Big Bob at the table, you know. Yeah. You know, Big Bob should be testing games. No, I don't think they're hey, I'm not Big Bob. Time, so am I Big Bob? What's the deal Come on. I'm going to use Big Bob as the, sorry for someone here who's Bob. <laughs> So yeah, so when Big players time. are too small, <laughs> that is frustrating to me. And so if you would like to continue this discussion about player shields, I'm happy to discuss it because it turns out to be a very important topic in my life. <laughs> my number one. My number one, this is a list of, of small joys. I, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it's supposed to be. Uh, I love it when you're, you're, you're playing, it's somewhere in the middle of the game, you've got a couple of actions left, you've got one action left, and so you, you sort of, ah, what do I do with this last action? I'm going to dart over here, it's worth two points, mine as well, right? And then you get to the end of the game, and you win by two points. <laughs> it's a small joy. <laughs> you know, it was one little thing you did in the middle of the game, it was like, ah, I, I did this. <laughs> and then, then you win. <laughs> it's a small joke. Only for you realize so, that. Yeah. But you you know that that small sort of throwaway two victory point action is not the one that won you the game. Don't take this from me. Chief. <laughs> it's that turn, that turn you had that you made sixteen points where everybody else seemed to not be doing so well. That's the two points. <laughs> so <laughs> my annoyance. This is being is corrupted. <laughs> That's what the other player does. It. I call. I call it. Oops! I forgot to win. <laughs> you reach the end of the game. That is. Bad. This is You're going down the list. There's the list of end game scoring. All right, we do this. You get 15 points. You get six points. All right, you got this, and then moving along the score track, and we reach the final thing on the list. And uh, hey, Eric, looks like you won. Good job. And then, then Z it. goes. Oh. oh, yeah, I got this power. <laughs> I get three points for every city. And he wins. <laughs> and it's not necessarily that I lost. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Mm -hmm. It's no, that not. he took it from me. <laughs> well, technically, it. Eric, uh, you never had it in the first place. I had it! <laughs> and then he... You know those two points? You should. There was a clear, obvious choice that would have given you seven. <laughs> you missed it. I'm sorry. It's not so much that I won that than it is that you lost. No. It's a small annoyance, but growing. And I'm, and I'm number one. 
All right, my number one, I'm gonna start with the annoyance. And that is very, very simple for me. That is boring themes in games. <laughs> no more trading in the Mediterranean. Yes. No more generic fantasy. There how is- come, Tom, how come you're not throwing your hat in game, man? I'm just so happy right now. Yeah. <laughs> I am so tired of seeing the same things in games. There are about eight billion topics that people haven't covered yet in board games. And that is why my delight is every time I see a board game with a theme I've never seen before. I don't care if it's chickens that are laying gems or us collectively remembering a vacation we took together, murdering people who are staying at a hotel you manage, or up and coming, or up and coming rap artists who are, who've got beef with one another. <laughs> Those themes delight me to no end, and I want to see more. So if any of you are aspiring game designers, if you put trading the Mediterranean in your game, I'm never going to play it. <laughs> never. Really? Even I'm not that adamant. I'm just, they, even if the mechanics are good. Like, they're, a good example, Z last year taught me Carpe Diem. It is a really solid game. It yeah, is, it's a very the mechanics game. are wonderful. And it looks so good. That is <laughs> I am not compelled to seek out Carpe Diem because it doesn't draw me in the way other games do. And I will admit, the mechanics are great. The game was enjoyable, but it just does not draw me in like other games do. I want something compelling about the theme. The mechanics are important, yes, but if you can put an interesting theme on top of those good mechanics, you'll have, I'll, I'll buy your game all day, every day. Yeah, but the opening paragraph is so good. <laughs> Carpe the Diem. And you're off. <laughs> Wait, so which was that now? That was the annoyance? I think that was both. It was both. I did both together. It was a got hybrid. it, got it. That's how it's done. That's, that's literally what right, you asked me to do. I know what I said. <laughs> For my number one, I had... Bleh, bleh, there it is. For my number one, I had my uh, thunder severely stolen by Suzanne Sheldon. Yes! <laughs> yes! And here's the great part. So wait, did she beat you by like two points at the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that what just happened? Yeah, that's right, yeah. That's called meta top five. Um, <laughs> and the great part is that you got both halves. You wow. nailed both parts. That just, that's because we're so in tune, man. Maybe that's it. Just and this was thing. It's you know? really annoying for me. It, I mean, it really, really bothers me. It sounded like it quite bothered you too, though. And that is expansion components that don't show what expansion they're from. That, that my annoyance. Come on. Give me a symbol. Give me something. It's so easy to do. Yeah. And then, it, it, what blows my mind, too, and I've seen this in several games, the first expansion... No indication. Second expansion has a symbol. And I'm like, did they just discover that they could do this? But also, do the newer printings of the first edition have it? And do I need to buy it again? Yeah. The worst. I hate that. And then the other thing, perfectly cut cards. You know, if you, that, they got to get that right. That's the one thing. I mean, the color thing, like you said, it's hard to do, especially if it's, if it's been a long time. So honestly, some publishers blow your mind because they, they get it just right. But the miscut cards, nothing is as deflating of a feeling as getting your brand new expansion. You feel like you're going to revitalize this game you've enjoyed and it's kind of been collecting dust a bit and then you, you get it out, you set it up but you look at the cardboard bits, they're great and you shuffle the cards together and it's like two monkeys fighting in a closet <laughs> <laughs> like what is this? you shuffle that they all still, yeah. they all stick together if they're the same size, it's either all new cards or all old cards <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. locked yeah, yeah. in the shuffle, yeah Oh, I hate that so much. So that's it. You, 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 everything you said. I feel so connected to you right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If Thank we you weren't that. separated by two strange bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bunnies. Uh, all right. Well, that's that. Yeah. This again. These are minor things and small things. I hope more for fun than not. But I'm really still mad about most of them. Um, <laughs> Any last final thoughts before we hang up the mics? 
Is everybody having a good time at the con? Is, is everyone sad it's almost over? Yeah. That's right. A tone. No, that was the positive and the negative. Yeah. I'm annoyed it's almost over. <laughs> Alrighty, well, thank you so much. We'll be back next time. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. I'm Eric Summer. I'm Crystal Pisano. And I'm Z Garcia. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode was recorded in front of a live Leap Day audience on February 29th, 2020. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Eric, Mandy, and Suzanne with assistance from Roy Kennedy, Mike Delicio, and Rob Seary. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme. Mr. Van Dyke, Butkus, Tracy, and Cheney's Game of Tag brought to you by Dick's It. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network. Find your next favorite at DicetowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming! Woo! <laughs>